Well, hello and welcome everybody to our Saturday night sermon study from Romans 15, 1 to 13. Romans 15, 1 through 13. As always, feel free to comment. You can comment right there in the YouTube comments or wherever it's posted in social media, and I will try to check up on it. Uh, but excited to look at Romans 15. I'm going to jump right in to the Bible passage, and we'll get going right into this study tonight. Keep it a little shorter tonight so that folks will get who are getting on a little later will still uh, be able to follow us. But Romans 15 really is about glorifying God together. Glorifying God together. By the way we live out the Christian life, we glorify God together. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ came, became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all peop the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. This is the word of the Lord, and may God add his blessing to the reading and study and the application of his word tonight. All right, so we glorify God by the way we live together, live out the Christian life together and in relationship with one another. So in this first section, verses 1 to 7, he calls us once again to accept one another, to welcome one another, to receive one another, and particularly the strong and the weak. So he's summarizing that same previous um, sort of frame of thought from chapter 14, about those who are strong, particularly those who are more free in their faith, and those who are weak, particularly those who are a little more constrained, uh, struggle with uh, um, more rules and regulations in their faith, and that there should be grace given both ways. This is what he says here. We who are strong, so Paul puts himself in the category of the strong. Strong in faith, meaning he feels, he knows he has the freedom when it comes to worshiping God, not to be held to the uh, Sabbath regulations or to food laws or anything like that. There's a freedom. But we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. This is what we've seen all throughout chapter 14, right? Those who are strong in faith should bear with those who are weak in faith. Let, us, uh, let each of us please his neighbor for his good. Now, he doesn't talk. he's not talking there about man-pleasing, you know, that you are just trying to do what to make, make your neighbor happy with you. He means that each of us should seek the good of our neighbor, right? Seek to serve our neighbor, not just our own needs, not just our own interests, but the good of our neighbor there, um, to build him up as he continues. And notice what he does here, though, something that he hasn't done um, uh, perfectly clear in chapter 14, but he does here in verse 3. He puts Christ as the perfect example of one who does this very thing. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And that's a quote about Jesus taking upon himself our sin, our rejection, our reproach. So Jesus himself, of who had the ultimate strong faith, right, doesn't use his faith or his strength for his own personal freedom, to do whatever he wants, he uses it to serve. In fact, he's the ultimate example of one who sacrifices his self and love in order to help those who are weak. 
he mentions here that these things are written down for our instruction uh, that we would endure. Uh, that's super important, by the way. Um, the reason why the Bible is written down is for our encouragement so that we would endure. So, in other words, these things really happened. They happened to the apostles. They happened in the Old Testament to ancient Israel and so forth. But they were carefully written down, recorded, <laughs> you know, encapsulated, inscripted, so that future generations like us would read it, be encouraged in our faith, and endure. Right? So, super important that we have the scriptures as a great explanation of the scriptures <clears throat> and why we have the Bible today and why God uh, wants us to have the scriptures today so that we would endure. By the way, the calling here to endurance is plural. You, plural, would endure. So you as the church together, side by side, welcoming one another, loving one another, and so forth, would endure faithfully living out the Christian life. That's why the scriptures were given us, including these prophecies about Jesus, the one who's reproached in our behalf. Um, and then he asked God with a benediction here. Um, he asked God here for his blessing. May the God of endurance and encouragement. So now God is described by those very things. The one who encourages us by the scriptures and calls us to endurance. May he grant you to live in such harmony with one another. And we've talked about the beauty of that word harmony. To harmonize is not to be the same. To harmonize is to be different and yet function together. Right? That's what a harmony is in music. You have different notes, different um, sort of instruments and so forth in an orchestra, and yet they harmonize together. So it is with the church, that God would help us be encouraged and endure as we seek to live in harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that with one voice, one harmonized voice, we would glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the point of the Christian life, that it glorifies God, right? And then he says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. So there's this point for the glory of God. So we are called to welcome one another as Christ has done that for us. He's the example. He's the model. Um, the strong should use their strength to help the weak. Now, isn't that an amazing thing about that? It's the opposite of the world. The world says the strong are meant to dominate, right? The strong are meant to use their power to overcome, to rule, um, to uh, assert their will, right? In fact, that's sort of, sort of the whole point of uh, Darwinian evolution, right? Is that the strong um, are the ones who survive. Darwin famously said that the one general law is this, the strongest live and weakest die, right? Because that's what you do. That's the most adaptable to change, the strongest, uh, the one who's able to overcome and empower the fittest. That is the one who survives. In the weakest, those who have deficiencies, those who are physically weak or otherwise are dominated and then they perish ultimately. But here, notice the Christian faith is called to go against that. In this case, it's not the strong dominating the weak, it's the strong taking that very strength that we have, if you have strength, and using it to love and care for and serve the weak. It's the opposite of what this world has to say, right? Um, it's the opposite of Darwinian evolution or social Darwinism, which is the application of uh, biological Darwinism to social groups, where social Darwinism is, again, the strongest will overcome, well, overpower um, the weak. Here, those who are physically stronger, those who are mentally, emotionally stronger, are meant to serve. And here, of course, he means specifically spiritually stronger. Um, by the way, that's always been the Christian way. Th that we're called, if you're able, if you're, if you're wealthy, you're called to help the poor. If you're physically fit and strong, and you know, physically strong, you're called to use that to help the disabled, right? You're, we're, we're called to help the elderly, help children, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. That, that uh, true religion is this, to care for widows and orphans, right? And in first century and throughout many generations, in most cultures, the widows and the orphans are the most vulnerable in society. 
you know, a widow back then couldn't just, you know, go to work in the typical way that maybe a widow could today. Um, and same thing with orphans. And yet, what is the calling of the Christian life? That those who are strong lay their lives down in service to those who are weak. I love that. It just cuts directly against the culture and what we're supposed to do. But here he's talking about spiritually. So it is so true as well that those who are strong in faith, they have that freedom, are not called to just use their strength and bully around those who are weak in faith and say, look, I get the fr I'm free to do whatever I want. They're called to humbly use it to serve those who are weak in faith and help them grow spiritually. Um, to love, to serve, to encourage, to remove stumbling blocks, to be at peace with others. Um, receiving others, welcoming others glorifies God. It glorifies God. Um, being alone is extremely valuable. And I'm an introvert. My natural inclination is to be alone, right? I like to be alone, right? And there are a lot of spiritual disciplines that are that are come out of being alone. Prayer is often, there's there's corporate prayer, but there is also private prayer. There is go into your room, close the door, um, pray to your Father who is unseen, right? There's fasting. Jesus said, when you fast, don't let others know that you're fasting. Do a, do a private fast before the, the scripture reading, right? You do a devotional reading in the morning. You, you sit by yourself, you open the Bible, you read, you let it speak to you, um, you, you get alone, you spend time in silence. So all, all of these things are important. They're spiritual disciplines. They're valuable. They're meaningful, right? But you do them so that you come out of them and better love your neighbor, right? So those are not an end in themselves. I mean, they do glorify God and we do worship in, uh, to God in those times. But we are called to then, the higher virtue is love. To now take all that God is doing in your life and use it to love and to serve your neighbor. Um, that's why the local church, by the way, is so important in the Bible. And nowadays, you've got sort of spirituality is very important. And the local church is this thing on the side that you might choose to use if you want to, to help you along in this whole spiritual spirituality thing you got going on. That's not the biblical picture. <laughs> the biblical picture, the local church is smack dab in the center of our spiritual growth and development and spiritual life. I mean, the two are together. And it's in being part of a church called to love and to serve and to bear with one another is essential. Welcoming those who are different than us, welcoming those who are weaker than us, is what the Christian life is really all about. Forgiving people, bearing with one another, serving others. We are better together. We are stronger together. Right? Even the military knows this, right? When you think of someone who is truly independent, outstanding, you know, who's able to fend for themselves, you, you might think of, for example, um, the Navy SEALs, right? a Navy SEAL, right? Well, what is it? It's the elite of the elite, right? The elite warrior uh, in our country, perhaps, although, I mean, I'm sure the, you know, Army Rangers would like to give that a go, <laughs> but uh, let's say the Navy SEAL, even around the world, the Navy SEALs are looked to as an extreme um, uh, special operations group. Do you know how the SEALs function? They always function in teams, right? Because they, they know there is a greater strength that comes with working with others. There's a greater strength with people with different gifts, different strengths and weaknesses, different personalities, different skills and abilities, all functioning together. The, the, the military knows this. and There are eight SEAL teams. That's how the SEALs work. Each team, um, eight operational platoons and a headquarters element. SEAL platoons consist of 16 SEALs, two officers and 14 enlisted men. So there are eight teams and each of those eight teams are 16 men. 16 SEALs, all functioning using different gifts together because the military knows what is common sense and what the Bible has always said is that we are meant to do this together. Spiritually, we are stronger together. Being alone is one of the most dangerous places to be, spiritually speaking. But we glorify God more than that as he goes now to talk about reaching the nations. Reaching the nations. And this is fascinating because you might say, what's the connection here? Because the next thing he says is, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that's another name for the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. So God, Christ comes to the Jews 
and he confirms all the promises given to the patriarchs that he is the Messiah and he's come to save and redeem his people. Verse 9, and in order that, and in order that, the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. It's not just the Jews, but the Gentiles also might glorify God. Again, our pursuit, our aim is the glory of God. And then he proceeds to quote four different quotes from the Old Testament, some from Samuel, the Psalms, Isaiah. And what basically what these all four of these quotes from the Old Testament talk about the Gentiles, the Goyim in the Hebrew, right? The non-Jews, the nations. Everyone else on the whole planet, basically, besides the Jews. That all the nations are meant to praise God, to extol Him, to give Him worship. And actually, there is an order, by the way, to these four, if you want to know. Um, the first one uh, there talks about the Gentiles, therefore, uh, praising God. Um, uh, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. So it's actually... Um, uh, the Jew praising God among the Gentiles, among the Goyim. The next one talks about a calling to the Gentiles, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. So a calling upon the Gentiles to praise God. The next one is a calling directly to um, the Gentiles. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. Um, so and then the final one is talking about the Messiah, who has come to rule the Gentiles, that they might have hope. So you see this calling among the Gentiles um, to praise and extol God. And you might say, again, wait wait a minute, Pastor Rick, we just went from talking about the strong and the weak, and the local church called to love and serve one another, to talking about reaching the Gentiles. What, what, is, what are the, how do, did he go from one to the other? It's very simple. Most of those issues that were arising among the strong and the weak in terms of their faith had to do with Jew and Gentile differences. So the Sabbath regulations and the food laws had to do with the fact that you had Jews in the congregation who had celebrated the Sabbath their entire life and felt like this is still something they're obligated to do. And you had Gentiles who felt like, I don't need the Sabbath regulations. I've never celebrated the Sabbath. Doesn't Jesus make every day holy? And you had Jews who were saying, you can't eat this meat that's been sacrificed to idols. It's polluted. It's wrong. And you had Gentiles saying, I've been eating this meat for my entire life. So those are the type of differences that arose based on the Jew-Gentile difference. And see, here he's getting at God's plan has always been to reach the Jews and to reach all of the Gentiles. But in to, re to do that, to bring all these nations together, there's going to be these differences of cultural opinion. These differences of strength of faith and what we feel free to do and what we don't. And uh, the truth of the matter is, friends, um, those cultural differences shouldn't get in the way of our unity and our harmony. In fact, those cultural differences are beautiful. They're good. They're meant to be. They're, they're, here's the thing. God is the author of culture, right? Culture is not a negative thing. And in fact, when the gospel comes to us, it doesn't obliterate our culture. Right? Our culture continues on. Um, th think of the gospel like an antidote to poison that you put in your body. Okay, It's the antidote to sin. Now, you can put that antidote to sin in an Asian. You can put that antidote to sin in a Latino. You can put that antidote to sin in a Jew. You can put that antidote to sin in an African American. You can put that antidote to sin in a Caucasian American. <laughs> you can put that antidote to sin any in any one of us, and it's going to cure the poison of sin in us. So that's how the gospel works. It comes into a culture and frees us from the bondage of sin. But it doesn't destroy the culture that surrounds it. Culture is meant to be actually a good thing. By the way, missionaries are getting much better at this. So in the past, missionaries have done a poor, poor job in this. They've come from Britain or America into these countries like India or elsewhere, and they would try to transform the entire culture to become westernized. Dress like a westerner, act like a westerner, have the manners of a westerner, 
you know, do all the stuff that we do, have our music, our hymns, our praise, our type of, you know, all these different things, try to enforce uh, upon these countries that we're seeking to reach Western culture. But missionaries have gotten a lot better about this and understand that's not what the calling of the scripture is. The calling of the scripture is actually to bring the gospel, which is transcendent, it transcends culture, into a new culture and let them keep all that is beautiful and good, all the art and music and food and dance and um, worship styles in that culture. Maintain all of that, but allow the gospel to transform. It's where we find forgiveness of sins and which begins to transform our lives. Understanding that difference of culture, of, of the nations, is so important to our unity. Our job is not to say, this is what I'm comfortable with, this is the style that I like, therefore you have to do what I do if you're going to be really spiritual. Uh, and really the end, friends, is to see all the nations and what is beautiful and good from every culture glorifying God, magnifying Him and praising Him. Um, to reach the nations, we are going to have to focus on the main thing. <laughs> Keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's not about how we dress. It's not about the type of music we listen to. It's not about our differences of opinion when it comes to any number of different issues, right? By the way, Jesus didn't wear a necktie to church. He didn't wear pants to church. He didn't wear shoes to church, okay? So if, if you're saying to be spiritual, you got to wear not sneakers to church, and you got to wear, you know, um, whatever, a necktie, a shirt and tie, or a jacket and tie, and all that, uh, Jesus wore none of that, understand, right? Different culture, different way. Um, he was not, most likely not clean-shaven. He had a beard, um, although he probably didn't have long hair, by the way. That's a mis misnomer. Um, I don't think that's the case. Actually, we have almost no mention of the, of the style that Jesus had, and I think that's for our good. The gospel comes into a culture and transforms that culture and all that's good about it. My favorite type of churches are multi-ethnic, multi-racial, diverse churches. I don't like the idea that on Sunday morning, every sort of racial group or ethnic group kind of hides away into their own church. I don't like that. I mean, I think it misses something beautiful about the gospel that's bringing us all together. Um, I love to see a church that's filled with diversity and all of those exterior things and yet united on the most important thing, on the gospel of Jesus. By the way, a couple things on that. Next Sunday, for those who are watching this here on Saturday night, maybe even on Sunday, next Sunday, we're having a guest preacher, Dr. Paul Kim. You don't want to miss this. He leads the Asian Fellowship within the Baptist Convention of New England. He's their pastor emeritus of um, uh, Antioch uh, Christian Church in um, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, brilliant man, um, and a godly man. You're not going to want to miss that. That's next Sunday. So listen to that diversity. You have Paul Kim. And happy to announce that ne that uh, just recently, last Sunday, the new pastor of New Life Community Church in Georgetown was voted in with a 100% voting, um, 100% vote. That almost never happens. Just so you guys know, I was not voted in with a 100% vote, right? There were like six people that voted against me. I don't know who they are. But nevertheless, um, that is a rare thing to see happen. Pa the pastor, Lier Tesouros, is Brazilian. Um, and uh, he's a young Brazilian guy. I say young, he's, I think he's younger than me. Um, and that's a primarily Anglo church. Uh, but well, how cool it's going to be to have a, a Brazilian brother pastoring New Life Community in Georgetown and he and I are definitely going to be connecting. So just exciting to see that type of diversity. By the way, here in the United States, we are becoming more and more diverse very quickly, ethnically, racially, and in all different ways. Embrace that. That is not a bad thing. That's a good thing. In fact, what we as Christians should certainly be doing is embracing the multiculturalism, the multi-ethnicity, uh, the idea of equating evangelical Christianity with Anglo-Americanism is suicide. Spiritual suicide is what I mean. You're going to eventually 
wipe yourself out of existence. Because as America gets more and more diverse, we should be embracing the Christian brothers and sisters within that broad spectrum, which is the healthiest thing for us to do to say, look, God is bringing the nations to us. Um, there are different cultures. Look beyond saying we have to do things this way. We have to do things the way I'm used to it, the way I'm comfortable with, the style that I like best. Enjoy the diversity that God gives his kingdom. And then this last verse, verse 13, told you I was going to keep it quick tonight. Um, we glorify God by living with hope. And he gives this benediction here at the end, second one in this section. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. What did you notice was repeated multiple times throughout that benediction? The idea of hope, right? So he's first of all, he's called the God of hope. It's a defining characteristic of God. Not that God is hopeful. More than that, that he's the God who gives, who gifts, who grants hope to his people. May he fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And we've talked about that, that the kingdom of God is about righteousness, joy, and peace. So here he says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace, so that, the reason why he wants you to have joy and peace is so that, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So the God of hope fills you with joy and peace, so that you'd abound in more hope. <clears throat> because hope is so essential and central to what we all are all about. What is hope? Hope is future-focused faith. Okay? Um, faith has a more present sort of dynamic to it. I believe, I trust in Jesus. If we are thinking about, I trust in what Jesus will do in the future, that's my hope. So think of hope like faith is very future focused. You probably heard me say this before, but hope does not carry the connotation of doubt that we um, are so used to today. When we use the word hope, I hope I win the lottery. I hope I get an A on that test, right? Um, I hope I get a new job someday with the expectation that I prob those things probably won't happen, let's say. That's not the idea of biblical hope. Biblical hope is described almost like waiting with eager anticipation for what God is doing in the near future, but putting our trust and our faith in him in the midst of that. Um, and friends, what unites us in all of our differences, partly, is our hope. No matter what you believe about the Sabbath, no matter what you believe about the food laws, no matter what you believe about Halloween, or what you believe about... Um, uh, drinking alcohol, what you believe about smoking cigars, what you believe about, uh, uh, go on and on here, um, COVID vaccines and all that, our hope should be the same, which is in Christ's return to redeem and rescue his people. That if we die, we'll be with him, our spirit goes to be with him immediately, but the day will come when Christ returns and he will set all that is wrong right. And that, friends, is what unites us even amongst our differences. There is perhaps no more powerful unifying factor than having a single hope, right? In heaven, we're not going to fight about the non-essentials, right? There's not going to be any big battles in heaven about um, the millennial kingdom. There's not going to be any big battles in heaven about baptism anymore because we're going to have the truth at that point in time. What we're going to be doing is enjoying God forever, enjoy glorifying him and enjoying him forever. Friend, hope... Hope is what keeps us going. I don't think there's a more powerful motive to keep going than hope. Here's what hope does. What you believe about the future affects everything right now. Hope enables us to persevere. No matter what you're going through, what trial you're going through, um, what struggle you're facing right now, if you have hope, you can endure it. I know there's a lot of people even in our church, who deal with chronic pain. Chronic pain. Every day they face a different pain. And maybe for some, you've heard that pain is never going to go away. It's a new normal for you. Now, if, if that's going to be for eternity, that's despairing, right? But if, if, if the promise is, no, it's not eternal, you will deal with that pain, perhaps, until Christ returns or until you die. At which point, that pain will be forever gone 
and you will be alive in the presence of God. Does that help you endure? I know it would help me endure anything, right? Um, what we believe about, we're willing to endure great struggles, great pain and suffering. We're willing to go to the gym and push our muscles to the point of aching. We're willing to, you know, run miles and miles and miles if we're training to try to get to reach a specific goal because there's a hope of a light at the end of that tunnel. Hope changes how we persevere. It gives us, it's like a shot of adrenaline to overcome whatever trials and difficulties we face in this life. Hope sanctifies us. It glorifies God when we put our hope in him. And hope recognizes there's a certain sense in which God is using this time for my good and for his glory. There's a purpose, there's an end, there's a meaning to this time. I'm not here aimlessly. I'm not just going through things by chance and willy-nilly, this and that. There is a there's a specific aim and purpose to the time that I'm going through right now. And God is using it in my life to make me like Jesus and prepare me for glory. It gives us a sense of confidence. Okay, this is not aimless. There's an end. There's a goal to this. And then hope reminds us of the urgency of mission. If we recognize that time is short, life is short. This life isn't going to go on forever and ever. There's a sense in, in which we realize that I better get to work. I better get to it. I better start evangelizing. I better start getting on mission. I thought uh, the other day the evangelism training class was excellent. And it would have been a good reminder to us to be mindful, be praying, be looking for those opportunities to share the gospel with those around us. That God has uniquely given you a specific personality and a specific network of relationships to minister within the context that he has called you to. Get to it. Um, hope the day is we're going to be with Jesus. And at that point, it's going to be too late, right? The gospel's gone out. The final number has come in or whatever. However, God works his perfect plan. But until then, we got to get to work. We got to share Christ. We got to be about his work in his kingdom. We glorify God together friends as Christians. We glorify God together by accepting one another, by reaching out to the nations and all the different cultures coming together, and by, be, by being filled with hope with one another. When we do this, we glorify God, we find again the primal purpose for which we exist. The reason why we were created to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It is a taste of heaven, friends. The, the truth of the matter is, for those who are Christians, this world is as close to hell as you will ever get. And all that is to come is only good. And for those who don't know the Lord Jesus and will never receive him, this world is as close to heaven as you will ever get. But for us who are in Christ, we even now get a foretaste, a, a little preview of what heaven will be like. And that is us together glorifying God and enjoying him. Love you guys. Have a great night. And uh, I'm looking forward for the, if you're watching this tonight on Saturday. I'm looking forward to being gathered together tomorrow as a church family. And may the Lord bless you. Love you. Have a great evening. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye now.